Greetings and welcome to Mr. Van Lowe's poorly monetized low budget science channel. Do not click like, do not subscribe. Okay, today we're going to talk about topic 11.1 .1, electromagnetic induction in IB physics and your learning objectives. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to describe the production of an induced EMF by changing magnetic flux within a uniform magnetic field, solve problems involving magnetic flux and magnetic flux linkage, as well as Faraday's law. You'll be able to explain Lenz's law through the conservation of energy. Okay, so first we're gonna look at the motion of an electron through a magnetic field. And you should recall from topic five that an electron moving through a magnetic field is going to experience a force. That force will be perpendicular to the magnetic field it will be perpendicular to the direction of the electron's motion. So this is going to give us our first right-hand rule. I'll put up a video link to my topic five uh, lecture. Okay, uh, you should also recall that a circle with a cross uh, shows an arrow into the page, and a circle with a dot shows an arrow out of the page. Okay, so that gives a direction of uh, various elements here. Okay. So first we've got motional EMF. Uh, and what we have here is a conducting rod of length L moving through a magnetic field as indicated by these green arrows into the page, okay? The velocity of our wire is given by this green arrow here moving to the right. And that will be the velocity of our electrons initially. Okay, so defining characteristic of a conductor is our freely moving electrons. They can move through the conductor as they like. Uh, and our electrons then are going to experience a force. They will move to the bottom of the rod, leaving a positive charge at the top of the rod. And this is what we need by definition for uh, an EMF. Okay, uh, you can check the accuracy of this diagram by reviewing your right hand rules in topic 5.4. Uh, check out the video link that I put up. Okay, so uh, the value of the electric field inside this rod is going to be given by E is equal to uh, epsilon divided by L. And epsilon is going to be defined as EMF uh, or electromotive force. Okay, uh, the unit for EMF incidentally is volts. So L is the length of the conductor, uh, which is generally going to be a wire, but could also be a bar, any, any metal really, uh, or could be graphite, I suppose. There are non-metal conductors as well. Anyway, moving on. Uh, from topic five, we know that Q times E is equal to QVB. Uh, and we're going to define these variables in a second here. But uh, Q generally is going to be your fundamental charge, uh, the charge of an object. Uh, we'll see that in a second. Uh, v is going to be velocity. B will be the magnitude of our magnetic field. And E is electric field. Okay, so E then will be equal to V times B because Q is going to cancel out of both sides of the equation. We then substitute our previous equation for E. And what we're going to find then is that EMF is equal to uh, our magnetic field strength times velocity times the length of this conductor L. This is in the data booklet. And just clearly defining all of our variables here. Um, note that this charge in most cases is going to be the fundamental charge, uh, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Okay. Um, the unit for volt, uh, if we break down a volt, we're going to find that a volt is equal to work per charge or energy per charge. Also, uh, we can add wires here to our system, and that's going to give us this equation, uh, also in our data booklet, where B uh, epsilon EMF is equal to B times V times L times the number of wires, and N will equal our number of wires. Okay, so that is also in the data booklet. All right, we're gonna look at motional EMF here. And here we have a conductor moving along two wire rails, okay? So this is our 
previous conductor and now we've connected it to a circuit. And our circuit contains a resistor and we will have uh, current and power consumed by this resistor, okay? So if we use uh, Ohm's law, uh, we can substitute our value for EMF here and we'll find that current is equal to uh, B times V times L divided by resistance. Uh, B is our magnetic field strength, V is the velocity of the conductor, L again is the length of the wire. Okay, we also know uh, from topic five that force on a wire will be given by um, B times I times L, where I is equal to current and L is equal to, again, the length of the wire. And so therefore we can do a little substitution here and we'll find that uh, by substitution force is equal to B squared times the velocity of our conductor or wire times the length of the wire squared divided by resistance. Uh, and this is the resistance of the circuit. We're generally going to assume that our wires have zero resistance. Okay, so resistance of the circuit. Um, these equations are not in the data booklet. We can derive them uh, over time, but it might be worth recalling them uh, or being able to quickly derive them as you never know what's gonna come up on an exam. Okay, so we have several paths that calculate the power in this system. And they could be summarized by this series of equations. We've seen this before in topic five. Uh, here we have then EMF squared divided by resistance. Uh, we can derive this using Ohm's law. And we've also done that in topic five. Uh, and this then is going to give our, this is new where EMF squared will be equal to velocity squared times magnetic field strength squared times the length of our uh, wire squared divided by the resistance in our circuit. Okay, so this is not in the data booklet, but you may find it to be handy. And again, just defining all of our vari variables. Uh, one key point about our force and our velocity here, uh, these must be constant in order for our power to be constant and uh, the rest of this equation to work. So keep that in mind. And there are our defined variables. Okay, so moving on to magnetic flux. Uh, here is a diagram, uh, and I have taken a screenshot of a FET simulation. Uh, please check out their website. They have lots of good stuff on there. Uh, and I'll throw in a link in the description to this video as well. Uh, we'll see it at the end of this presentation also. Uh, so this diagram is show, showing a, mag a magnet near a loop of wire. Okay, so this loop is attached to a resistor, as you see here, and we have a voltmeter measuring potential difference across the resistor. Okay, if our magnet remains stationary to a loop, nothing is going to happen, and just hold on to that thought. Uh, so magnetic flux is de defined as the strength of a magnetic field through a loop of wire, okay? So right now we have magnetic flux in our system. And that value is going to be given by this equation. Here we have a Greek, a Greek letter, uh, this is called phi, uh, and this then will be equal to B times A times cosine of theta. Okay, so let's define our variables. Uh, B is going to be, again, magnetic field strength, A is going to be the area of the loop, and the unit for magnetic flux is going to be a Weber meter squared, okay? So Weber is, of course, the uh, magnetic field strength. Okay, so <clears throat> theta is determined by measuring the direction of the magnetic field against the normal of the loop area. Okay, so here's our loop, and we have a normal line that is perpendicular to our plane. When we measure this angle, we measure it against the normal, okay? And then that is going to give our uh, flux. So what we have here is a, a vector. You might recognize that. Okay, so if we increase the angle here, we're going to decrease the magnetic flux. And where our magnetic field is parallel to the loop, 
flux will be equal to zero. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is because cosine of 90 degrees is equal to zero. Okay, so our flux is going to decrease uh, as we increase our angle. And where our magnetic field is parallel, we get zero. Okay, so flux linkage. Uh, as we saw in our wire example, if we add a wire, we'll get an increased EMF. Here, similarly, uh, if we add a loop to our previous example, we will double the flux, and a third loop is going to triple it, and so on and so forth. So on and so forth. So our flux is linked to the number of loops, uh, and if we include uh, the number of loops in our equation, we get this where phi is equal to n b a cosine of theta. This is not in the data booklet, uh, at least not directly, although we will see it appear um, kind of indirectly, okay? So, easy to remember, NBA basketball, there you go. Uh, and of course, it's going to be the number of loops. Okay, so now, if we move our magnet in relation uh, to this loop, what we're going to find is that our flux is going to either increase or decrease. So um, when this happens, uh, we're going to induce a current to flow in the conductor. So you can see here, we now have voltage, uh, we have an induced EMF and an induced current. Okay, so our induced EMF is due to a change in the strength of the magnetic field. We have to have a change. If we have no change, no relative motion between our magnet and our loop, then we have no induced current, no induced EMF, nothing is happening, okay? So a change in flux is going to occur, occur whether the field strength is increasing or decreasing, okay? so. Uh, that's really, really important. So our EMF is therefore given by epsilon, and this will be equal to negative n times a change in magnetic flux divided by a change in time. Okay, and you might recognize that there is some calculus occurring here. Uh, you don't need to know the calculus. All right, so n is equal to the number of conducting loops. Uh, change in phi is equal to a change in magnetic flux. Delta t is equal to a change in time. The little delta there always tells us we have a change. Uh, and if EMF is induced in a conductor, then we will see current, and we've already kind of discussed that. Okay, so the magnitude of our EMF uh, and current can be increased by increasing the relative speed between the coil and the magnet increasing the strength of the magnet, increasing the number of turns or loops of wire, there's our N, uh, increasing the loop area, remember this is equal to uh, area of the coil times our magnetic field strength. So if we increase loop area and our magnetic field is constant, then we will get an increased uh, EMF. Uh, we can make our angle of the magnetic field more perpendicular to the loop plane. And that's it. Okay, so coming to the end now, uh, last thing we're going to cover is Lenz's Law. Definitely related to Faraday's Law, which we just saw. So why do we get a current induced in a conducting loop? Uh, to explain this without advanced mathematics or university level physics uh, will just anthropomorphize the universe and say that the universe hates a change in flux. It does not like it. Okay, so uh, the current and corresponding magnetic field in a loop is therefore going to oppose the change in flux through a loop. Okay, so here we have uh, an induced current in this loop and you can see an induced magnetic field uh, which I've called B prime here. So here's our magnet, it's dropping through our loop and our magnetic field strength is increasing through the loop, which the universe does not like. So it induces an equal and opposite uh, magnetic field. Okay, so I think I've covered these bullet points. 
Uh, this also is going to produce a force between the magnet and the ring, okay? So this magnet will actually slow down uh, due to the opposing force. Um, you will not need to calculate that force for IB physics. Uh, we don't cover Lenz's law quantitatively. Okay, direction of current uh, through the loop can be determined by using the right-hand rule for current in a loop. And this is just the same as the right-hand rule for current through a wire, okay? So uh, if you use the right-hand rule for current through a wire, what you're going to find is that the magnetic field is the same direction through the loop no matter where you put your hand, okay? So the induced field direction is going to give the direction of current in the loop. And we've already discussed this last point here. Okay, next up, uh, if we move the magnet away uh, from the loop, this is going to decrease magnetic flux. And again, the universe does not like that. So uh, a magnetic field is going to be induced and now it's going to be in the opposite direction of the magnetic field from the magnet, but it's in the same direction, or rather the opposite direction as the change in the magnetic field, okay? So what we're opposing here is the change in magnetic field strength. Okay, so this is going to uh, reverse the current, uh, in, in comparison to our previous example, where we had a counterclockwise current, we will now have a clockwise current. Again, following our right-hand rule uh, for current through a wire. Okay. So any change in the magnetic field through a conductor is going to be opposed by an induced EMF and its magnetic field. This is similar to Newton's third law. Uh, but instead of dealing with uh, forces here, uh, we have induced reaction fields. And forces are involved as well because uh, a force will be exerted on our magnet. Again, you don't need to calculate that force. Okay, here are my sources for this lecture. Uh, we have SOCOS, uh, Physics for the IB Diploma, always excellent. I also used this FET simulation uh, to grab a couple of screenshots. Uh, Wikipedia, I looked up Lenz's Law and also Faraday's Law of Induction, so you can check those out. Always support uh, Wikipedia if you can. Uh, FET is also excellent. I also used uh, Google Slides, Adobe Illustrator, and LaTeX. I am working on an 11.2 lecture, but my standards are kind of high for these, and so um, I'm not. I'm doing some modeling in Blender, and it's time consuming. Uh, anyway, have a great day, and definitely do not click like or subscribe unless you really have to. Okay, take care.